Hey, howdy everyone. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And now we're going to have, as a continuing series on machine learning, we'll talk about the very first prediction-based machine, linear regression. I know, I know, it doesn't sound great, but let's see. Let's see. It's going to be a good discussion. What's our motivation? Well, we'll start with the simplest prediction model we could come up with. And we'll explore concepts like, what is a machine? What are norms? And I have a previous lecture I just recorded just now talking about L1, L2 norms. I'll leave that discussion to that. Model variance, model bias, confidence intervals, prediction intervals, and so forth. We can do that quite readily with a linear regression model. It's very powerful. We will build from here to ridge regression, the last SU, and so forth. We'll, we'll do all of that. But let's go ahead and get started. Let's ask a question. What is a machine in machine learning? And so really, it's a mathematical, statistical, data-driven model that learns from data, support it with expert knowledge. And so we hope this is there. Um, not always the case. It, it, we could probably still call it machine learning without even expert knowledge, but we'll put it there because that's our belief. It should always have expert knowledge because we're engineers, geoscientists, scientists, and so forth. Not explicitly told how to predict. It's a general method that may be applied to a range of problems. We're a model that could be used for many, many different problems. So let's give ourselves a problem. Load up a data set. And we got a simple porosity versus density data set shown right here. I want to build myself a model. I'm going to try to fit a model to that. So let's go ahead. We're going to build ourselves a model. So we can run just one line of code in Python. And the result is we can fit this lovely model. And um, it's great. We run SciPy functionality, lin regress. We put in the predictor feature, the response feature, and the training data set. And out comes the slope and the intercept and some really cool other parameters that we'll talk about right away. So this is our model. Let's visualize it. So that's our linear regression model. Doesn't look bad. It's doing a pretty good job of predicting from density to porosity. And that's a powerful model because many times we can model or measure density using remote information and aversion stuff to get to acoustic impedance, make some rock assumptions, and, and we can then predict through the density to porosity relationship that we've produced here, the porosity at all locations between the wells. This is this could be really cool. All right, so that's fine. Everything's good, right? Well, let's just talk about, let's make a couple of comments around what exactly linear regression is. It is a form of supervised learning. Let's go back to the fundamental equation that we used for prediction supervised learning is we have a set of predictor features x1 through xm and we're going to try to fit some type of function to go from those features, the predictor features, to the response feature y. And we'll acknowledge that our model won't be perfect. There's going to be aspects of the data we don't capture. In other words, there's going to be some error too. We're going to predict y from x. And we're going to work with a continuous y, so this is simply going to be regression. Now, why cover linear regression? Super simple, right? Everyone's done it. Good start to simple prediction methods to demonstrate the fundamentals. All the confidence intervals, prediction intervals, parameter tests are known. And we have analytical forms for them. And so we can go ahead and solve some really cool problems while doing it. We can learn a lot of fundamentals by working with linear regression. Now we already talked about this issue about norms. Check out the previous video. And so we'll just mention now that our role is to now minimize the error across all of the training data. And so we're going to take the sum of the square differences between the true values and the model prediction values across i equals 1 through n training data. Okay, so that's going to be our role. We're going to fit our model using that, and as we mentioned before, we're going to use the L2 normalization. This is a least square solution that we're going to use for linear regression. And so what we can do is we want to minimize the sum of squared errors, or, you know, if you divide by n, which won't matter, you'll see it wouldn't matter, we could minimize the mean squared error. So we're going to take that equation, all we have to do is do the partial differentiation with respect to the B1, the slope term. And so this right here, there's no surprise. This is your estimator. 
linear regression, we have a constant term, and we have slope multiplied by the predictor feature. We're doing just one predictor feature. This is pretty straightforward. Then what we can do is we can solve for the partial differential with regard to that slope term. And if we do that, this is what we get over here. Pretty straightforward. With this, then we're able to do some further manipulation. The first thing we can do is the negative 2, let's just pull that out. We can go ahead and pull it out on the other side, and it just disappears. So we can get rid of that. Then we can take the x1 and multiply it through everything in brackets, and we get this expanded form. We can then substitute this relationship to remove the b0 or the b0 term, the intercept term, because we don't want to deal with that right now. We want to solve for the b1. So then we substitute that in, and we can then expand it back out, and now we get these terms right here. Now this is pretty cool. This is good. We're, we're starting to get somewhere. What we do next is we can take that, the same as we had in the last page, we can reorder them, and because the sums are linear operators, we can just pull them apart. We can take the sum of two of the terms plus the sum of the other two terms, and we separate them so we get the ones with the B1s and the one without the, the ones with the B1s and the ones without the B1s separately. Then we can go ahead and move that to the other side, bring this onto the other side, and then divide both sides by the sum of this component right here. And the result is we get B1 equal to this. Now this form is a little bit awkward. We, we got to this proof, so it's convenient from the standpoint as we know we can do that. But we'll be able to show with just a little bit of effort that this form right here is actually equivalent to this other more common form that people often use to calculate the slope term. Now I want to point out an interesting feature here. If you were to take this term right here, this product of these centered values, the x1 minus the mean, the y1 minus the mean, so these paired values, and you divide by n, that would be the covariance. Now if you took this term right here and the xi's minus the mean squared divided by n, that would be the variance. Now of course we had divided by n divided by n, they'd cancel out. So this is equivalent to the covariance of x and y divided by the variance, which is kind of an interesting result to get the slope. You can think about that intuitively and what that means. Then once we have that, we can go ahead and repeat what we did before. But in this case, we'll do the partial differential relative to, partial differentiation relative to the constants, the intercept term, the b naught. Go ahead and since we're minimizing, we'll set that partial differential to equal zero. And then we can go ahead and divide out the negative 2. We can get rid of that. We can expand. Once again, it's a nice linear operator, the summations here. So we can just go ahead and expand out all of these individual components with sums. And we'll see very quickly that the sum of a constant, 1 through n, is just equal to n times the constant. We can pull that to the other side and then divide the n out on both sides, and we get this relationship right here. Now, if you look really carefully, what you'll see immediately, we could separate this using the common denominator of just n, and we would see that this is just the mean of y minus mean of x times b1. So in other words, we can substitute the means of x and y in and just solve for the intercept term at any point. Okay, so we just derived this linear regression. What are the assumptions underlying linear regression? Now this is interesting. The first assumption is error-free. The prediction variables are free of error. They're not random variables. And what does that mean? Well, if you look at the fundamental model, y equals f, x1 through xm plus epsilon, we expect error to exist vertically on this in this plot along the response feature. But we do not expect error to exist. We're in fact assuming precision or complete accuracy or hard data with regard to the individual predictor features. There's no error in those. They don't move back and forth. So that's the fundamental assumption of the model. If we had an error there, that would significantly increase the uncertainty in the model. Constant variance. We assume that the variance, that is this spread away from the model of the true data and difference between that and the model predictions, that that in fact, that variance or level of dispersion is constant over the range of the predictor features. That is a homoscedastic error. The error term does not depend on the magnitude of the predictor feature. We also assume, of course, linearity. 
The model is going to be a linear combination of predictor features. If it's highly nonlinear or can't be linearized after a transform, then we really can't use this type of model. Independence of error, we're assuming that the errors at every one of these data locations, going back here, that the magnitude of these errors are not somehow correlated, that we have areas of kind of high or low systematically correlated with each other. And we don't have multicollinearity. If we had multicollinearity, recall from the previous discussion during multivariate analysis, that's the variable ranking, feature reduction selection, that this idea is that one of the predictor features can be described as a linear combination of the other predictor features. What would happen then? We could be building a model, an m-dimensional model, when we really only have m minus 1 or less piece of information to support that or information. Okay, the great thing about a linear regression model is that there's lots of great support analytical known, analytically known relations for judging the model. First of all, of course, we can calculate the R-squared value. The R-squared value is the strength of the model, the proportion of variance explained by the model. All we have to do is calculate the, the sum of the squares of the between the estimates and the mean of the feature, and we can divide by the sum of the squares of the individual training data to the, error, to the estimates, which would be the error term, and we go ahead and add in the variance explained. Now notice that I'm not dividing by n. The reason I'm not worried about dividing by n in this case is because when we divide, we're going to have n on both the top and the bottom, and it will cancel out. Now I should also note that in the case in which we're dealing with a bivariate um, measure of co um, correlation, such as the correlation coefficient, that the R-squared value, since it's describing the degree of linear relationship, is actually can be related directly to the square of the correlation coefficient. So when you, when you calculate a correlation coefficient, you know exactly the proportion of variance that will be explained if you take the square of that with a linear regression model. Now we can test the significance of this. This is really great. By looking at the explained variation versus the total variation, we can pose an F test to test for the significance of any of the linear predictors for the response relationship. And so this will test the entire model at once to see if, in fact, there is a significant amount of the variance that is explained by the model versus the case where none of the variance is explained by this linear regression model. We can also perform t-tests in order to test the significance of each one of the model parameters, i.e., are B1 and B0 significantly different than zero, and so are we actually getting value from our model. So let's define confidence interval. It's the uncertainty in a summary statistic, a model, model parameter, represented as a range, a lower and upper bound, based on a specific probability interval known as a confidence level. To communicate a conf confidence interval, we'll make statements like there's a 95% probability. In other words, our confidence level is 95%, or 19 times out of 20 would be a common terminology that's used in media and on TV that a model slope is between a certain value. In other words, the model parameter having a specific range as a function of the available data and the variation seen in the data. Now, we'll cover analytical methods here, but we could also use the bootstrap methodology, as we discussed before, to get at the specific sampling distributions for any statistic. We can get this uncertainty in any statistic with bootstrap. What we're calculating is the uncertainty in our model. And we could think about it as a conditional probability, the expectation of the response given a specific combination of the predictor features. Now, we can calculate with analytical form the confidence intervals for a linear regression model. And so for our case here that we're working with, we can see that it's quite simple. We have a standard error, and the standard error can be calculated. Now I show here in Excel, um, it is one of the outputs when you do linear regression and you look at the parameters for the model, you'll get the standard error in the slope terms and the standard error in the intercept term. Then what we can do is we can just apply the 
student t distribution, it's two tail, so we'll have alpha divided by two, and our degrees of freedom will be n minus two in this case. So we can go ahead and calculate the uncertainty for our slope parameter and also for our intercept parameter. So that's pretty cool. We can get those directly analytically for a linear regression model. Now, of course, we'll also be concerned about the prediction interval. We don't want to just know the uncertainty in the model, its parameters, but we want actually the uncertainty in the next prediction. That's a prediction interval, not the uncertainty in a statistic or model, but in the next observation that we could observe. So in other words, we want to be able to figure out the upper and lower bound based on a specific probability in interval, the confidence interval like before. We can communicate the same way as we did before, probability, and 95% probability, 19 times out of 20, that the true reservoir net gross is between 13 and 17%, given we had a model, our linear regression model, that was predicting net to gross given some other features, predictor features. We're calculating the uncertainty in our pre prediction, not just the uncertainty in the model, the model parameters. And so the way to think about it, we need to add our model of estimation error on top of the uncertainty in the model itself. So it includes the uncertainty in the model. That is, I mentioned before, the expectation of y given specific x parameters and the conditional distribution, the error around that expectation that's provided to us by our homoscedastic model of error around our linear regression model. Now, this provides us really nice uncertainty model for predictions. So, and recall, this is effectively telling us, hey, for this set of predictor features, this is the uncertainty in the next observation you could see given those features hold. That's, that's pretty cool stuff. So we could answer a question like, given I know the porosity, the next sample of porosity, with a 95% probability, tell me what the interval will be containing the true value of permeability, if I was to build a relationship going from porosity to permeability. So this is very powerful. We'll have our model estimate will be the center. We're expecting the model estimate is unbiased. And once again, using the student t distribution and the standard error calculation that's shown right here, what's really cool about the standard error calculation, we can see the fact that we're including the specific model of the homoscedastic variance, which is shown right here. All of the, the, using the degrees of freedom, but looking at the square difference between the observations and the model across the entire model, homoscedastic. So now let's step back and just kind of remind ourselves about something. And that is, even in a simple model, we can be overfit. We always have to ask ourselves, does the data support the model? And here, of course, is a case where I can fit a line to two points. But to what degree am I interpolating and extrapolating? Um, are we really able to fit this model? And so even when we work with multilinear regression models, we still got to be considering, do we have sufficient data and how far can we extrapolate outside of the sampled range of the predictor features? So this was a very simple first dive into prediction with machine learning. And we, we challenged everyone. We said, hey, we're going to go ahead and just use linear regression. And we'll say that's machine learning. And I don't think there's a good argument to say that it's not. It satisfies many of the criteria as far as being flexible and able to learn from the data. Now, it also minimizes the error with the training data. That's really cool. And we talked about norms. We talked about in what sense does it minimize? Because we have to go from a vector of all the error terms across one through n training data to a summarization of that. And we may choose a well, an L1 or an L2 norm. We had a separate video right before this one where we talked in more detail about that. Talked about important assumptions about the data in the model that while we allow for error in the model with regard to the response features, we expect or we assume that the predictor features are error-free. Model can be tested for significance, a portion of variance explained. That's very cool. We can test the individual slope and intercept terms or parameters, model parameters, 
and we can test the entire model at once with the variance explained approach with the f-test. Includes uncertainty in the model. We talked about the confidence intervals to be able to see that uncertainty in the model given the data available. And also the idea of a prediction interval to predict with the model and a knowledge about the predictor features another observation of the response feature. And suggested that there, even with a very simple model, could be issues with overfit and extrapolation. So I like thinking of machine learning as an advanced linear regression, line fitting to the data, a data-driven approach. Now, of course, we'll get into much more complicated methodologies as we go along. And, you know, we will at some point be looking and see linear regression far, far in the past in our rearview mirror as far as this course goes. But at the same time, every time somebody shows me a complicated model, I ask them, did they try multilinear regression? Did they try a simpler model? So we don't forget about it. We still will use simple models for comparison, and sometimes they're the best model. All right. I hope that was helpful to you. I do have some demonstrations in Python and even in Excel with all of the testing and so forth that I will walk through too. So, but for now, I'll leave it there. I'm Michael Perch. I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. I teach and work in data analytics, geostatistics, and machine learning, specifically in spatial problems. I am the Geostats guy on YouTube and also on GitHub and Twitter. And so you can check out some of my resources. I record every single one of my lectures. I put a lot of workflows up. I've coded up a Python package in Geostats and spatial data analytics. And I'm always happy to discuss. So um, I hope this was helpful to you.